And, and plus, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I always love when a reading uh, uh, starts off with, uh, or when the reading ends with uh, being cast in the outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth because the children's message is next. And that's always such a fun way to start a children's message. <laughs> You're thinking about outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those of you joining us on Facebook live stream, welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. We're, we're using Matthew, uh, Gospel of St. Matthew, verse, uh, chapter 25, verses 1 to 30. In the Bridesmaid's Parable today, Jesus is reminding us once again the work of our faith practices so that when the kingdom of heaven comes alongside us, we'll recognize it when it happens. Today, Jesus is giving us yet another description of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like. And a description of what it is like when we can't see the kingdom of heaven. Like the bridesmaids who didn't bring the oil for their lamps. We leave ourselves in outer darkness. Why do we need to prepare today? I mean, isn't tomorrow close enough? Isn't next week a good time to prepare? Why do we need to prepare today? The truth is, it probably is good enough to wait till tomorrow, to wait till next week. In the history, the 2,000 year history of the church, uh, gotta say, it's unlikely that tomorrow or next week we're gonna see the kingdom of heaven. But, you never know. You never know. I'm not a sky falling kind of person. I don't believe in, you know, getting all wound up about much of anything. But it seems to me that being prepared for the kingdom of heaven is a wise choice. And it's not, a, it's not a question of if you're not ready for the kingdom of heaven, you're going to hell. That's not how it works at all. But when it comes down to it, what is the downside to being ready? What is the downside to preparing? What is the downside for increasing our faith and our connection to God? kingdom of heaven notwithstanding. There is no downside to that. That's all good stuff. I don't have a secret decoder ring that tells me how exactly we're supposed to prepare to recognize the kingdom of heaven. I don't know of a secret handshake. I don't know of a magic formula that tells us how to open the gates to automatically to the kingdom of heaven. God doesn't open up the top of our heads and sprinkle in some understanding and put it back so that we grasp what the kingdom of heaven looks like. It's not how it works at all. What we do have is a series of instructions throughout Scripture and our, our teaching that describe to us how to do that. And it all begins with prayer. That's mentioned a whole bunch of times in the Bible. Prayer prepares us. And, you know, you have to read the Bible to know that that is mentioned a lot. And there's nothing wrong with a little devotional reading of the Bible to help expand our understanding of, of what it is that, that we're reading. Jesus is very clear about being generous, and, and not surprisingly, coming to worship is also highly recommended. Plus, here at Spirit of Hope, if you come to worship, you get confession and communion every week. Which is like a buy one, get all the add-ons and no extra charge. <laughs> You wouldn't miss out on that with a set of tires or a new set of pair of shoes. No missing out on God either. All right, all right. Coming back to the more serious ideas, then so what? So what is the so what of all of this? What does it matter? We know full well that we are saved by grace through our faith. And so why all the work? Why is that required? What's necessary about that? Well, I think what it comes down to, if, if all else fails, living according to God's will is a pretty good way to live. Aside from being ready to recognize the kingdom of heaven when, when it comes alongside us, living according to God's will turns out well as a group. It would be simply amazing if everyone lived that way. By living according to God's will, I mean something, I don't know, like living according to the Ten Commandments. Just keep it simple and start there. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty good list. And by that, I mean not talking smack or killing each other. By that, I mean honoring parents and taking some Sabbath time every week. By that, I mean loving God and not taking each other's stuff or wanting to. That's such a good start. If we could just hold on to that, let's keep it simple and straightforward. 
Wouldn't that be amazing? If everyone was living according to the Ten Commandments? And the truth is, if you're the only one doing it, it's a pretty amazing way to live. Which carries us into the second part of the parable. Or the second parable, I'm never certain which it is, because they're separate and yet related. Anyway. Anyways, the, 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 the master of the property entrusts his, three of his slaves to, with money, talents. The parable of the talents, they call it, but he's talking about money. And a couple of them did something with what he had entrusted them with. They took the money, they invested it, they gambled it. I don't know how they did it, but they increased it. They took that money and did something with it. The third one was in fear of the master. The master was apparent, apparently a kind of a harsh dude, and, and you know, if you messed up, he was going to take care of it. And so the third one lived in fear of the master and got absolutely nothing done. What if I told you this parable isn't about money? It gets used that way. And I think back over my years of doing things, like, you know, starting out as a stewardship chair, and the ways I've used scripture badly, this comes up on a fairly regular basis. And it, it always sounds like, see, look how these people were blessed by their master. And how they increased their blessing and brought more back to their master, who then in turn blessed them with more. And they in turn, and you see how this goes and goes and goes and goes. And what this is, is what we call the prosperity gospel. Because it's focused on prosperity. We prefer to be focused on Christ. It's not about money. It's about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that first and foremost, verse 1 of our reading today. This is about faith. We are given the gift of faith by the Holy Spirit. Now we can do something with it, like the first two slaves. Or not, apparently, like the third one. If we take our faith and we do something, our faith is multiplied. If we step out in faith to do something to serve the kingdom of God, the kingdom is multiplied. If we do nothing, our faith just sits there. And like anything else in our lives, if we don't exercise our faith, it withers on the vine and dies off. On the other hand, if we take an active role in our faith, there's one critical thing that happens. We apprehend our faith a bit more so that we can more easily recognize those God moments when they come to us. So that we can more easily recognize the kingdom of heaven when it comes alongside us. Why do I keep going on about the kingdom of heaven? Why do I keep bringing it up? I'm not. Jesus is. Blame him, not me. Mm -hmm. I'm just a messenger. Mm -hmm. I'm just passing on the message. I am passing on his message. And like I said last week, remember in Semitic literature, or the culture that comes out of the Semitic writing, repetition <laughs> matters. If something is showing up again and again and again, it's because it's important. And they want us to know about it. God wants us to know about it. In this case, Jesus wants you to be ready to recognize the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew wants to shake us out of our complacency. And so it has us thinking about outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that when heaven is here, and God surrounds us, we're able to experience both. Our faith. Do something. And we leave ourselves in the dark. To God be the glory. Amen. I'd like you to please stand as you're comfortable in and continue worshiping us all.